Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Matt Horn is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Sir, we've landed. Are we still in all go? We are go. We're dropping a secret team of robots into a country that we're not supposed to be in. It got serious the moment it was thought up. <laughs> hey! Stand up! You're all gone! Or I'll kill you! Do it. People have seen everything. Take them all down. No witnesses. Hey Matt, I was just in this really cool movie called Monsters of Man, which we shot in Cambodia, and it looks really phenomenal. Uh, the director Mark Toy made it with such a small amount of money, and it looks like a freaking blockbuster with explosions and killer robots and lots of blood and lots of crazy things happening. So I really think you would enjoy the movie, and I would like to chat with you about that if you want to know more about how we made it and how the entire experience in Cambodia was, let me just tell you about it anyway. We shot it in Cambodia over the course of two months. It was super exciting because we got to work with locals, got to go to really exciting locations, got to go on very sacred ground and had people around us constantly praying for our protection. But not only that, we also worked with real explosions. So not all the explosions you see are CGI, but we actually had a bunch of stuff explode in front of our faces. And a bunch of the actors got a bit hurt and had to go to the hospital. So uh, all that you see is real. You could call it method acting, actually. But I really think you'd enjoy this. Anyway, i got to run, but feel free to give me a call back whenever you can. And I look forward to speaking to you soon. All right, bye. On the line, we have Geordie Tallon is talking to us. From, where are you talking to us from, Geordie? I'm calling from Los Angeles, California. Wonderful stuff. Are you still in lockdown? <laughs> Uh, yes, we are. I'm still inside. Haven't left the house in months. It's great. <laughs> mm. Well, obviously, I do need to get this out of the way. This is breaking news, Geordie. Like, literally, <laughs> now, as in now, okay? Uh-huh. Now. More than two million people around the world have died of COVID-19. Uh, yeah, that is incredibly sad. What was 2020 like for you? Uh, can I can I curse? <laughs> um, <laughs> it was everything I didn't want it to be. But at the same time, in the United States, we also had a lot happening. George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement uh, that became very vocal. I do think that a lot of beautiful things were accomplished. Uh, I think that people's voices were being heard. I think that a lot of changes were being made and a lot of changes were being put into motion. Who would have thought that this podcast would continue on? <laughs> Sold you on despite everything not being released. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> here we are. So obviously the reason why we've got here is to talk about Monsters of Man. Yeah. Now, can I start off by asking this question? You'll, you'll understand why I'm asking it. Was the original intention to release it on streaming services or was it going to have like a theatrical release? That's a good question. So from the get-go, Mark Toya, director, writer, producer, uh, genius behind this entire movie, I think his initial idea was to have it in theaters. I think his initial idea was to have it globally released in theaters and for people to enjoy it, you know, in an IMAX setting, because the movie is shot to be watched in an IMAX setting. But due to the pandemic, I think that Mark Toya slowly came to understand that the whole distribution world was a bit different than what we initially were expecting it to be. So he kind of let go of of everything else and just did his own thing with it and went and self-distributed this entire movie. But I don't think that was part of the initial plan to start out with. I mean, I've seen the trailer. How would you even describe a robot like that to anyone who hasn't seen the poster? (laughs) Yeah. So, well, I'll put it this way. The story is about, you know, a bunch of medical students that go to Cambodia, kind of like Doctors Without Borders, to help people out there. And the U.S. Army has dropped four battle robots and these robots are fighting killer robots they are equipped with the highest 
quality of guns and knives and explosives and so on. So these are just, you know, you do not want to come across these robots and you do not want to aggravate them in any possible way because you will not outrun them. They are the epitome of Greek gods. They will destroy you in a second. So we kind of encounter these robots, uh, unfortunately, and we, we run for our lives for a huge part of the movie. But we come across, you know, beautiful scenery and, and we unfortunately lose a few of our fellow doctors due to these robots and villagers get killed and villages get destroyed. It's, it's quite brutal, but it's, it's an epic movie. It's an epic movie. But these robots are incredibly dangerous and they look epic. They look fantastic. And, you know, I have to say, we shot it with CGI, so these robots were not really there, which is kind of sad because when watching the movie, I'm just like, oh, I just really wish that those robots were on location. That have been so cool. I mean, it's got iRobot vibes. It's got Terminator vibes. It's got Cloverfield yeah. vibes. I was also thinking a bit stealth. Stealth? I've never seen stealth. Stealth is the one with Jamie Foxx in where they have that new aeroplane and it all goes wrong. Yep, yep, yep. I've seen the trailer of that, I think. When you saw it for the first time and you actually saw the robots, was it it on set? Did they have something that said, look, this is what you're fighting up against, basically? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Mm. Kind of. When we got to Cambodia, Mark showed us all some sort of rendering of what the robot was going to look like. But... The robot ended up looking completely different than what we saw on set when we got to Cambodia. And throughout the last couple of years, because the movie has been in post-production for, I believe, three years, we would get images and screenshots and uh, little video clips of what the robot looked like. And we were just getting more and more excited because the robot became so incredibly real and so cool. And we would have never expected it to look so aggressive uh, in the end. It's about robots, these mm-hmm. prototype robots. Without giving too much away, how are they sort of making that, like, the main enemy, if that makes sense? Are they doing it sort of like an yeah. AI gone wrong, or are they trying yeah. to sort of say it's the government's <laughs> fault? So these robots are super intelligent, and they are programmed to follow the guidelines given by the coders who are constantly watching the entire thing unfold. Unfortunately, one of the robots loses its module and the robot becomes self-aware. And because it's such smart technology and such, such smart AI, they can make decisions for themselves. And all the robots, all four of them, are pre-programmed to attack the most dangerous person first and then kind of, you know, go to the next target. If they see someone with a knife and someone with a gun, they can analyze and say, oh, the person with a gun is the most dangerous. We have to eliminate that one first and then the one with the knife and then the other one with no weapon whatsoever. So they're very intelligent. And like I said in the beginning, they're killer robots. They are designed to kill and destroy. They don't come bearing fruits and, you know, gift baskets. They're there to kill. Sort of got a bit Jurassic World almost with the whole velociraptors. Yeah, you could say that. You could say that. They're not emotionally in touch with themselves, so they're not able to reason and rationalize and question their motives and their actions. They're just there to destroy, and that's it. (laughs) Well, I do have to ask the question. Obviously, we've got the first film Mm -hmm. in the can, released. Mm -hmm. Could it have a sequel? See, that's that's a Mark Twain question. I, I wouldn't know. I really wouldn't know. It definitely has the potential to get into a second movie. It, it definitely has a, a great ending where a second movie could be spun off of. But that's that's all Mark. I would love to be in a second movie. I think that'd be fantastic. Unfortunately, those uh, those choices are not in my lap. Mm. I mean, obviously, it, it's set in Cambodia. We can say that. Would the sequel go into a sort of a more urban setting, maybe? Possibly? Oh. Yeah, most definitely. I feel like Cambodia was a beautiful start for the movie, but it kind of ends... I, I, I don't want to spoil it. Kind of talking about the ending is really spoiling it, but it ends in a way where the whole scenario would basically land in the city, you could say. All over the world, there are maybe, perhaps, even more than just four robots. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, now. <laughs> yeah. I will actually go a bit dark here. There's a line that one of the characters says... He says something like, you were built by humans to kill. Given what's going on right now, that's kind of a bit ironic, isn't it? 
It is. It really is. Well, the background of the robot is that they're designed by a weapon company to indeed just destruct and kill everything on their path. And you can imagine that this might be an asset that could be acquired by the army at some point in time so we could fight other countries and other people and not lose any of the real people, but just, you know, put mechanical robots in the field and have those do the work for you. And that's what these robots are. But they are indeed created by humans to destroy, affect other humans. I remember filming that moment as well. We were all just like, oh, shit, yes, this is, yeah, that's intense, <laughs> you know? It was a very, very intense moment for all of us to kind of realize that this might indeed be the future for, for humanity. We might be faced with robots that turn on us. You know, what if once upon a time Alexa says, no, no, you listen to me and you do what I ask you to do. You, you play that song. You tell me what time it is. Just imagine how, how crazy and scary that would be when they rise up against you. And I really think that Monsters of Man really explores that as well, which is terrifying. Do you think that we're going too fast as a species in terms of technology now? We're definitely going way too fast. We can't keep up with our technology. It's not that crazy to think that well, this could all indeed be a simulation, or this could all indeed be, you know, someone who's playing with us in a, in a jar and we're all electroids that are flooring up against the side. Well, obviously, I do have to talk about the cast and crew. What was it like working with them? Well, the cast, they're all my best friends. I say this not lightly. We hang out at least once a week. Now, during COVID, we've been Zooming away at least once a week. We're friends for life. They were all fantastic people. And it was interesting because the casting process was done all remotely, and I had only met the cast once I got to LAX to fly to Cambodia. I didn't know any of the other actors, which was terrifying because you never know who you're going to get, and it's always, you know, hope they're nice, hope they're not, you know, annoying, hope they're friendly, hope they're wanting to help, hope they share the same passion as you do for the craft, but they're all great, and I can honestly say that Tatiana Marjanovic and Conrad Pratt, who plays Bao, but also the robot, they're probably my closest friends. And the crew was fantastic. They all flew in from Australia. The big part of the crew flew in from Australia. Mark also hired local Cambodian crewmates to help us with the movie. But the people that came from Australia, such as Wade, who was our first AD, and Pam, who was our producer, and Carolyn, who was, who was Mark's wife, uh, all of them were so fantastic and so great to work with. And I got really lucky because sometimes you get to sit and everyone is kind of in their own bubble and, and no one really connects you. But... I can truly say that we're all just one big Masters of Man family. Obviously, I do need to mention about explosions. Yeah. Can you elaborate further for us, Geordie? Of course. A lot of the explosions were done on site, uh, which was really cool because I like explosions. I mean, who doesn't like explosions? So we had a tech guy set up the explosive materials either underground or in a, in a bunch of debris. And we'd all find shelter, and then we'd have an epic countdown, you know, three, two, one, and then poof, the entire thing would explode in front of us. And that was really cool to experience. There's one moment in the movie, I'm going to try and not spoil this bit, but a certain character kind of explodes at some point, and that was really interesting to see how that technically was set up, because there was indeed an actual explosion uh, rather than CGI stuff, which was exciting and terrifying at the same time. But there's one explosion in the movie that's really huge that we also did uh, on site that was really cool. And I believe I saw the video of that as well on my phone. How did you guys end up in hospital? <laughs> <laughs> so one of us had to go to the hospital because he had a lung issue, which I believe was due to um, probably debris getting in his lungs or maybe um, too much air coming his way. No one was actually injured due to the explosions. However, in the movie, of course... It's a whole different story. People get really, really hurt by the explosions. Mm. Well, Geordie, let's talk a bit about you, you yourself. Obviously, we need to mention that you're not only just an actor, you're also a model as well. So I initially moved to L.A. for acting, took an acting workshop, and then I got very lucky uh, and got scouted by uh, a manager, a model manager, an agency, sorry. And he took me on, and quickly I got to work for some really fun brands, got to do some editorial shoots, Got to walk uh, runways uh, in Los Angeles, but I'd also done some modeling work previously in Belgium. So I had done some runways in uh, the Netherlands and Belgium, which was really fun, especially because I kind of grew up with braces and I was pretty chubby and I had sort of acne and 
I just didn't feel like um, that was something that I would ever do. But being in Los Angeles, a lot of commercial stuff is being recorded here. So from time to time, I still model, I guess I could say, from e-commerce to, again, uh, editorials to uh, fun commercials. I just did a commercial for Samsung, which was really fun. But a lot of those commercials are, you know, smiling and being very happy and very jittery. I would have thought with COVID going on at the minute, sort of the whole catwalk modeling photography type thing would have been halted but i suppose not we were able to kind of continue work there are ways of getting productions done for example i worked in a feature film and we had to get three COVID tests on set so you get to set you get a COVID test one rapid test another rapid test and then one overnight test and if your rapid tests were negative you were allowed in if they were positive you had to go home and quarantine of course what advice would you give to anyone wanting to pursue a career in the industry? Go for it. Do it. Have fun. But be ready to fall because you're going to fall and just get up and keep going. It's a very basic thing to say, but it's very hard and very difficult to do on a daily basis. I've been in L.A. for almost nine years now. You just have to really, really, really enjoy the ride because it is brutal. My one golden tip of advice would be keep at it and have fun. Really just have fun with it because that's going to be worth a lot more at the end of the day than counting your success. Well, obviously, we should also mention you're a director as well of shorts, <laughs> of short films. And one can only think you were sort of uh, thinking at the time, oh, what can I do now? I've, you know, I've stopped basically, yeah. of which you yeah. made a film. And this seems to be a thing that's going on now, especially in Hollywood. I mean, I'm going to mention Host again, for the record, being this whole zoom conference type film yeah. a bit like unfriended but yeah. we're also seeing the introduction of projects which are basically about quarantine yeah well as an actor or creative designer or creative creator i guess you find yourself sitting in your tiny hollywood apartment in the middle of a pandemic and you've read the books you had and you've seen the shows you want to see and you saw the movies that you want to see and you've gone through phases of drinking a lot of wine and playing video games and trying to work out and then suddenly you realize you want to do something else and there's this little bug inside of you that's just like, why don't you just create something? Because that's essentially what you want to do. You want to create something. So you kind of make whatever you can make with the resources at hand and the actors and fellow friends that want to be a part of it as well. So I started creating some short films during quarantine uh, because it was fun and because I needed to, because I, I just had to. I just had to for myself, for my sanity. The one thing that I learned out of directing, I guess, is being able to talk to actors. And being an actor myself, I kind of found a way of doing that in a way that actors also understand to what it is that I want them to do on camera. The things that we made during quarantine, they're never going to win an Oscar, obviously, but they're so much fun to make. And I think at the end of the day... You have to create just because you want to create. Quarantine with you is about you basically falling madly in love with a girl you've only seen from your window. Was someone thinking rear window at the time? The show You on Netflix, it's kind of a spin-off off of that, which is, you know, this random guy sees a random girl and he falls madly in love with her instantly and he becomes kind of obsessed with her and stalks her. And so I thought it would be fun to put that into a quarantine perspective because, you know, you're sitting in your little apartment and nothing is happening. But then this girl walks by and you're just captivated by her. But you can't really leave your apartment yet because that's sort of dangerous but also, you know, too aggressive. And it was fun to play with that idea. And at the beginning of the short film, Quarantine With You, you can see that the character finishes watching you on Netflix. So it's kind of an extension of that show, but then basically set in a quarantine setting. So that's kind of where the inspiration came from for me. Obviously, I have noticed on your IMDb one thing in particular that goes back quite a bit. I think we're talking mm -hmm. at least four or five years. Yeah. You were in a music video with Katy Perry. Yeah, yeah, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Uh, the music video is called Chain to the Rhythm, and uh, we shot that about four years ago. Uh, and that was a that was a crazy experience, only because the breakdown I got was uh, looking for a male model who likes doing roller coasters and is not scared of heights. Uh, this is for an A-lister celebrity. My rep submitted me for it, and then I had an audition video in which I had to just talk about who I was. And I booked the role, but I still didn't really know who it was for. So then I got to set at Six Flags Magic Mountains, which is on a side note, my favorite theme park in all of California. 
And I'm, I'm going through all the paperwork, signing all the NDAs and so on, because they don't tell you anything in Hollywood until you sign all the NDAs, uh, which is your non-disclosure agreement. And I'm sitting in hair and makeup, and this is at 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we're all still waking up. But until that moment, I still hadn't really found out who it was for. And so I thought to kind of lure it out of the you know, makeup and hair artists on set. So I'm like, oh, so uh, wondering, who, who's this for again? And they're like, oh, it's for Katy Perry. My heart kind of stood still because growing up in Belgium, the dream of going to L.A. was very vividly alive. It seemed so far-fetched. And being able to work with such A-list celebrities also seemed very far-fetched at the time. But sitting in this makeup chair, realizing that I'm going to be sitting or sitting next to her in just a few moments from that very moment was such a wild experience in my, in my entire existence so far. Getting to meet her, she was super lovely. She was really nice, uh, very professional, very beautiful. And that's the one thing that really, not shocked me, but surprised me. Because very often you think, oh, all these, you know, celebrities are photoshopped and they're not really that beautiful. But I sat next to her and uh, she was incredibly beautiful, incredibly beautiful. And she smelled <laughs> amazing as well, on a side note. So that was really a really fun experience. And then we got to do uh, the roller coaster, as you can see in the music video, uh, several times. The shoot was three days long, and the entire park was closed down for uh, the music video, and that was just an amazing experience to be on such a wonderful set and to be uh, working with such great talent and people that are you know high up in the industry. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was wild. <laughs> mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna shock you now. This is a bit weird for me. This sort of floors me. I've just done a YouTube search for the music yeah. video. Okay. Yeah. And as of January 2021. There is 659 million hits. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> 659 million views of your face. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. I can't grasp that. That's too many. I can't even count it on my fingers. I, I don't know how many that is. <laughs> I mean, if we're talking sort of population, isn't that like it's way over <laughs> the population of America, isn't it? It's a lot of people. Yeah, I'm kind of speechless. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, amazing. Mm, I thought I'd just throw it in. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> I mean, that's not the only the only music video you've done. There was also the other one with uh, Martin Jensen and James Arthur. Yeah, that was really fun too. That was a really fun shoot. I remember my audition for that, which was kind of terrifying. Auditions are always a weird beast. You never know what you're going to get yourself into. You can walk in and they can ask you the weirdest things and you would never be prepared for those things. So the music video is called Nobody by uh, James Arthur and Martin Jensen, directed by Carl Richter. I walked into the audition space and they were like, okay, um, so crazy dance for us. <laughs> and so... Uh, they played a track in the background, and I started crazy dancing. And then they were okay, crazy. This is this is great, but uh, now crazy dancing, but with this intention, and then uh, kind of build it up and then bring it down again. So I, I did whatever I thought that would look like. And then uh, you know, a few days later, I got the call saying that I booked it. We got to go to set, and that was wonderful. Uh, James Arthur and Martin Jensen were incredibly friendly, really nice. At that music video, I made two really good, well, actually three really good friends. Faye, who is. Um, lead female in the movie and the in the music video and then mickey who uh was doing background at the time but she ended up being cast and carl who directed the music video his new short film called rhythm and pace in which mickey and i play uh, love interests of each other and you're probably wondering now geordie <laughs> <laughs> yeah do you want me to hit it with you <laughs> i have no idea 8.2 million wow that's yeah. That's a lot of millions today. I know your tweet that will do something after this interview. <laughs> my dad actually does that for me. Whenever I call home and just check in with my parents, my mom will ask the usual questions. You know, how are you? Are you healthy? Are you happy? Are you doing what you love? And so on. And then my dad will tune in at some point and be like, hey, so I checked this video and that has 2 million views or that has 6 million views. And I'm just <laughs> like, okay, cool, dad. I'm glad, I'm glad you're keeping score. Cool. So that's fun. <laughs> I do have to ask, are there any music artists that you would like to do music videos for? Oh yeah, good question. There's a bunch actually. I would love to work with Dua Lipa. I would love to work mm. with Gaga, only because I feel like with Gaga you get such a narrative that is very often done in a very fashionable way. And having worked with fashion, I have uh, so much respect towards you know 
the designers on set and the makeup artists and the cinematography and the lighting. There is so much that comes to it. So I would love to work with Gaga. I think that would be such a wonderful experience. I would also love to work with Miley Cyrus. And I'm thinking I would also like to work with Sam Smith. I would also really like to work with some EDM artist, um, Steve Aoki, <laughs> one of my first picks, Martin Garrix, and then uh, Above and Beyond and Lane 8. Well, I do have to ask you the question. Would you ever consider doing a singing career or, or doing a musical, maybe? <laughs> I don't think uh, people would like my music only because I do not have a singing voice. I have private concerts in my shower, but those are only for one person, which is myself. But that's as far as my musical talent goes. <laughs> would you not consider doing like a musical? I mean, music, you know, doing dancing and all that. When I was younger, I did ballet for a while, and that was really fun. I did ballet in Belgium. I did two uh, shows in which I had the, the male lead, uh, which was exciting because it was ballet, and I, you know, never thought I could do ballet. But would it be impossible? No, I could do it. I'm not. I'm not a bad singer. I could train, and I could definitely get my voice to where it has to be for the musical. Which actors and actresses have been your favourites to work with, and why? And who would you like to work with in the future? Well, I'll take that first. I would love to work with Sam Mendes. I think he is super, 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 super great. I saw 1917 and I loved it. Uh, I cried. I saw it several times and I would love to work with Sam Mendes. Any production from Blumhouse, honestly, I would take it as well. I know that's not a person, but any production from Blumhouse, Blumhouse, if you're listening, find me, I will find you, whatever, hit me up anywhere. Um, I would love to work with Blumhouse. Other actors I want to work with would be Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio. Michelle Williams, uh, I think she's wonderful. And then some of the people I've worked with in the past that I want to work with again, uh, definitely Carl, uh, who's the director of the Nobody music video. He's wonderful. Mark Toya, I would love to work with Mark Toya again. I worked with a guy named David Lamelas, who is an Argentinian filmmaker, and I did a short movie with him as well, which premiered at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, and he was super great to work with. I think he, from all people, was very European, very European in his approaches, which I really liked. He was rough in what he wanted, and he was direct and, and fearless, and that I really appreciate in directors, and he really gave me that. Are there any sort of character roles that you haven't done yet that you would like to do? Yeah, I would like to play a very dramatic role, and with that, I mean um, the outcast. I would like to play the outcast, someone who's troubled, someone who might be an addict, someone who doesn't belong I really like to play the outcast in, in a feature film. In the, in the feature film, that would be wonderful. But also the total opposite. I would love to be the spoiled rich kid in a comedic rom-com or whatever. Uh, something really funny. One more thing that I really want to play is I want to be in a horror movie. I want to be in, in a horror, horror, horror movie. Monsters of Man is more of a thriller action sci-fi movie, but with horror, I mean The Conjuring, The Ring, The Haunting in Connecticut, something that will... <laughs> will keep you up at night, something with ghosts, something with Ouija boards and, and devils that haunt you and so on. Uh, that would be really fun to play as well. Yeah, I think those are the roles that I really want to play in the future. That'd be really fun. I am always down for a challenge. And like I said earlier, I feel like the roles that come to me, the projects that come to me come at the right time. Mm. So as I'm evolving as a human being and as myself, as Jordy, I'm sure that the roles will find me and I will find the roles as well uh, to play at the right time. You mentioned ballet earlier. And I suppose yeah. it's not too far a jump, pun intended, uh, too far a jump between ballet and theatre, and there's not a big jump or so from theatre to mocap. Would you ever think about doing mocap? Would love to do mocap. Love to. There was a moment on set of Monsters of Man where uh, I think I had a day off, and I remember walking up to to Mark Toya and be like, hey, if you need any more robots, I am, I am down. And he's like, no, we have a robot, but thank you, Jordy. I would love to do it. That would be great. Mark did use uh, a guy in a blue suit for mocap. He did oh. use someone and said, yeah, we had three guys in blue suits all dotted, all dotted out, and they would move, and they eventually became the robots. I guess I could say it's a CGI afterwards uh, that was done on them, but um, it, it's all mocap. And I have to tell this story. From time to time, tourists would pull up, and they would, you know, stop and get out the van and be like, oh, what are you guys filming over there? And these were just, you know, Westerners visiting Cambodia. And <laughs> Monsters of Man, you know, we were very, very protective of the project at the time. Uh, the producer would uh, walk up to them and then come back to us. And we'd be like, hey, what did you tell them? How did you get them away? And she's like, well, I had to tell them that we're filming a documentary about monkeys. And because we can't really film the monkeys, we have people in suits 
a mocap that will afterwards look like monkeys for the documentary. And so we had this ongoing joke, basically, that it was the monkey documentary that we were making in Cambodia. Well, as a matter of fact, we were just filming Monsters of Man. Uh, but yeah, we had guys in blue suits running over the jungle the entire time. And this is why I do this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful stuff. So, Jordi, I'm going to give you a one-minute plug, a one-minute plug to plug Monsters of Man and anything else you've got coming up. Well, Monsters of Man is a must-see movie. It is a movie that follows these doctors in the Cambodian jungle, and it's a very realistic movie. It's not too Hollywood. It's not too vulgar. It's a very beautiful composition of what really would happen in that situation, and that is exactly what you get from Monsters of Man. You are nailed to the screen from beginning till end, and you go through all the motions such as the actors do in the movie. I've also worked in a movie called Party that was shot by Kevin Von Stevenson, and that should be coming out in the next year or so. It's a teenage drama based on the novel called Party, and it's about a teenage girl that is suicidal and goes through a bunch of different things in her head, and everything she is going through in her head, all the emotions, all the emotions, all the memories she goes through, those you can see on film because those are exactly the moments that we played uh, in the movie. Uh, it's a very compelling story about the struggles you had as a teenager. Um, and then for the upcoming year, I guess, I am supposed to go to Japan for a feature film. I can't really say a whole lot about it because I signed an NDA, but that should be very exciting if COVID allows us to continue production. It's not Godzilla, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jordi, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Likewise. Thank you for having me. Well, obviously, we'll have to get you back. Would love to. Anytime. Mm. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Matt. Bye-bye now. Bye.